So we're going to go to page 68. 68. 68. Look at the image being shared. Kebabs in Fallujah, chapter 4. Oh, thank you, Elder God. Okay. Chapter 4, Kebabs in Fallujah. And we're going to read the caption here for this picture. Oh, man. I got a feeling this is the same stuff. Dark Mall Red, what the F? Okay, uh, this. Sadiq Zoman was detained from his home in Kirkuk, Kirkuk, Kuk, by the U.S. military, held for one month, then dropped off at a Salah Hadin Hospital in Tik Tikrik Tikrit by US soldiers. He was comatose with electrical burn marks on his feet and genitals. The back of his head was bashed in and he had multiple bruises on his legs, chest and back. January 4. Photo unknown photographer. Okay. Chapter 4, Kebabs in Fallujah. Beyond the Green Zone, dispatches for an unembedded journalist in occupied Iraq, Darjumal. Forward by a, someone that lost their soul. Chapter 4, Kebabs in Fallujah. On December 19th, 2003, Nearly a fortnight after the event, the Coalition Provisional Authority released its official statement about an attack on Paul Bremer's convoy. The civil, civil administrator announced that he had survived an quote, impromptu attack on December, 4, December 6. The CPA at that point was still unwilling to acknowledge that the Iraqi resistance was already a well-coordinated, sophisticated movement backed by an efficient intelligence system. The official line from the U.S. government, therefore, projected this and other attacks as random, unorganized incidents. Less than two months earlier, on October 26, 2003, U.S. Deputy Defense Secretary Paul Wolfowitz, the number two civilian in the Pentagon, was nearly killed when between eight and ten rockets slammed into the heavy defended Al Rashid Hotel where he was staying. The future president of the World Bank narrowly escaped death when the rockets reached the 11th floor, just one floor beneath his own. At this point, we were delivered what 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 was soon to become the ref, the refrain of the official U.S. line line on attacks by the resi, uh, resistance. It was first mouthed by Brigadier General Martin Dempsey, commander of the First Armored Division, and echoed later by Secretary of State Colin Powell, and repeated at nauseam in the following years. On occasion, on occasions that marked each tipping point or turning of the corner for the occupation, Dempsey told reporters, quote, "If we look back at some of what we might describe as more sensational attacks, I think you'll see it's usually the case that they follow some positive event in the lives of the Iraqi people." End quote. He added. Referencing, referencing a recent lifting of the curfew that, that shrouded Baghdad, quote, this is another example of that. We take three steps forward and they try to pull us one step back. And in fact, it doesn't work, end quote. 
Dempsey told reporters he didn't believe Wolfowitz was the target of the attack. Quote, I think this probably took a couple of months to prepare. His travel itinerary certainly wasn't known at that point in time. End quote. This was the exact line taken by Pentagon officials to describe the attack on Bremer. In that instance, the press was told that the attackers probably didn't know that it was the CPA heads convoy that they were attacking. It may have been pure coincidence that the rockets were aimed at the side of the hotel where Wolfowitz was and had missed his room by a few yards. A coincidence similar to the attack the day before uh, on the Al Rashid Hotel, when a U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopter guarding Wolfowitz in Tikrit was hit by R by RPG fire, which wounded some of his some of his crew. According to U.S. officials, this was certainly another opportunistic, random, and desperate attack. This same propaganda was recycled to describe the attack on Paul Bremer's convoy on December 6, 2003, the day Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld visited Iraq. Coalition spokesman Don Senner let reporters know at a press conference that there, quote, was no evidence of a planned assassination attempt on Bremer, end quote, and that, quote, it was probably a random kind of attack, end quote. To reinforce the point further, he elaborated, quote, attacks occur there all the time and he happened to drive through it, end quote. Three months after Bremer was attacked, General John Ab Abizet, the top-ranking U.S. general in the Middle East, was attacked by a flurry of RPGs that struck his convoy when he was visiting Major General Charles Swanock in Fallujah. General Abi, Abi Zed, uh, commander of U.S. forces in Iraq, was confident that the group who carried out the attack was not respons uh, rep representative of the rest of people in Fallujah. Every day on the streets of Baghdad, I was witnessing the deterioration of conditions in Iraq. I had been in Iraq for barely a month and had seen the steady rise in the number of people begging on the streets. Women sent their children after me with their hands stretched out as I walked to an internet cafe or to buy some food. There were times when I had a child grabbing onto either arm and I, as I walked. This grew worse when the temperatures dipped as the winter months set in. In a cold, wet, rainy day, I sat in the lobby of the Agadir uh, talking with Baha. Staring out the window at the falling rain, he said, quote, See how there are fewer cars now? Fewer people can afford the petrol. And now people will be freezing in their homes. End quote. Meanwhile, there was also an escalation in the number of murders and kidnappings. After the pro Saddam Hussein demonstrations following his capture, in which more than 40 Iraqis were killed by the Americans, Baghdad had settled back into a hesit hesitant, ten tense quiet. Piercing this relative calm would be random bombs and sporadic gunfire, a long since normalized aspect of night in Baghdad. Christmas Eve in Baghdad was a surreal experience for a Westerner. After a day of interviews, Akhil and I arrived at the Agadir to find the lobby filled with people flurrying around discussing the attack on the big hotel. We obtained, we obtained enough sketch, sketchy details to send us out once again in the direction of the most heavily fortified hotel compound in Baghdad, that of the nearby Shira Sheraton Palestine Hotel complex. We did so purely by trial and error, since accurate details are hard to come by in such situations. We asked a U.S. soldier who did not know what happened, 
but directed us towards the French embassy down the street, where we had been told the attack took place. He seemed quite friendly, so I asked where he was from. I am from California, he said. I could tell, I could tell he wasn't sure if I was an American due to my beard and the kafaya wrapped around my neck. To continue the conversation, I said, quote, I'm from Alaska. How are you doing, man? End quote. He replied, quote, hanging in there, brother, hanging in there. I was born in Anchorage, but now I live in San Diego, end quote. I told him to keep hanging in there, and he thanked me. As we began to walk away, I heard him say, quote, Merry Christmas, end quote. I swung around and wished him the same and saw him smiling at the instant instance of normalcy amid the chaos of war and torn Baghdad. We eventually reached the small field outside the hotel complex and were met by several Iraqi police manning a small checkpoint. They told us the attack had been launched from the field situated between the Tigris and the hotel. Tigris, Tigris, uh, between the Tigris and the hotel. One of them, who was smoking a cigarette and eyeing us nervously, filled in the details. Quote, at approximately 8.30 p.m., a car pulled up near a palm tree in this small field. Two men got out of the car calmly and unloaded a small Russian-made Kalishna missile. By the time it had launched, and slammed into the top floor of the hotel, we realized what was happening and started shooting at them. We had a big gun battle and the shot over shot and shot over 120 rounds at them, but they managed to escape. End quote. Walking down an unlit side street back towards my hotel, we stopped at a tea vendor about two blocks from where the, where the missile had been launched. Akil didn't think the guards, guard's story really stacked up, and so he asked the tea man what he had heard. There had been no shell casings around where they, had, uh, where they, where they said they had fired 120 times, and the guards had not been able to tell us what type of car it was even though they said they had shown uh, their spotlight on it. The team man confirmed our hunch when he said he had heard the huge missile explosion, but no bullets at all. Stories of incompetent, uh, hastily trained Iraqi police abandoned, as did stories of resistance fighters joining the police as infiltrators, which is probably what the men that we had talked with outside the hotel had been the trend of infiltration into the into both the iraqi police and army by member of members of the resistance increased exponentially in the coming months what we had just witnessed of the collateral collab collaboration between the iraqi police and iraqi resistance at the sheraton hotel incident was but a prelude to infiltration on a massive scale to occur in the security forces this was a this reading was a different reading than what uh, Dar Jamal read in uh, the video that I posted on my channel so this basically this book is basically Dar Jamal giving an account on a daily basis of some of the things he does some of the stuff is very just routine stuff some of the stuff goes into detail and i believe it gets heavier as dar jamal continues his stay in iraq because he gets to know people and some of the people he gets to know they die okay and there's some pictures that he has here District of Baghdad the day after Saddam Hussein was captured. Right? And this is Dar Jamal's 
This is Darjamal. Okay. Huge respect to this guy. Uh, we'll kill the the person at the bottom, right? And he lived in Alaska. And when this thing happened, when the invasion of Iraq took place, basically, uh, if I recall correctly, he sold everything he had, put some stuff in storage, packed up his bag, bags, and flew to Iraq to be an unembedded journalist. And he wasn't a journalist before. I forget what he was doing before. Okay, uh, let's read his little write-up. Uh, Dar Jamal is an independent journalist who has covered the Middle East for more than four years. He has reported extensively from inside Iraq for eight months and has also reported from Syria, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Uh, Jamal writes for the Interpress Service, Asia Times, and many other outlets. His reports have been published in the National, the Sunday Herald, the Guard, the Guardian, Foreign Policy and Focus, and the Independent, among other publications. On radio as well and television, Jamal has uh, reported for D DN and numerous other stations around the globe. Jamal is also special correspondent for Flashpoint on KPFA Radio Pacifica. He lives in California. Okay, and this book came out in 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 in. Mm, 2007 okay 